some of them that have gone to school for training to be a real estate agent. And I know people that have run schools and that teach, you know, real estate. When you go to real estate school, you're really learning about the fundamentals of being a real estate agent. They don't teach you how to be a real estate agent. So if you're not prepared for it, I think it's kind of like the unknown. It's kind of like, you know, if you've gone to like an old boys school and now obviously you're going to a college and it is college, you have girls and guys, you're like, oh my God, what's going on? It's almost like culture shock. And if you don't back away from it and actually learn how to adapt to a specific environment, you're not going to learn. You're not going to be able to get trained. Plus, I find that a lot of brokers have really steered away agents from not learning how to deal with people that are in distress. And it really is a shame because you can help people and you can make a, a massive amount of money in the industry. So I think it's really not understanding the unknown. Got it. Got it. Oh. All right. Well, we're ready. I'm interested in learning more. And I'm sure I see we have about five people watching us live. So go ahead and hashtag live. If you're watching us live, let us know where you're watching us from. Um, I have my phone right here so I can see you guys making comments or asking questions. I'll be moderating. So if there's any questions you have to ask Matt, I can go ahead and ask him because I'll be able to read your comments. So please, please announce yourself, say hello, tell us where you're watching from while he's talking and um, off you go. All right, awesome. So just so we're clear, so I don't see any of this. I'm going to do a pre uh, during the presentation. Maybe I'll ask that anybody ask any questions or they have any concerns. But if people want to write down their questions or their concerns and wait to the end, then we can get through all this and then we can obviously, uh, you know, answer everything, you know, accordingly and give people the time that they deserve. So without further ado, uh, Fundamentals of Short Sales, and I am Matthew Marinoff, and I am the Short Sales Savage, and I've been doing this, I've been in the real estate industry going on almost you know, 23 years. Um, and I'm an expert in the industry of distressed real estate. And I do run a loss mitigation company. And I really do love helping people and educate. And hopefully, you know, you'll learn tonight and you'll get educated. Um, that's if the slide works. <laughs> and there it goes. So in 2005, this was me in a nice dress suit, and this is me in a t-shirt in 2023. I realized nobody cares what I look like. I'm going to try to keep it PG tonight. Nobody really cares about what I look like. They just want performance. So in 2005, when I started, really nobody understood what a short sale was. They're like, what the hell is a short sale? And who the hell is Matt Marrow? Now it's like they kind of understand what a short sale is, maybe, but I'm really building a reputation in the industry. And hopefully I'm going to change the face over the next couple of years because people, unfortunately, are going to have to get used to the term foreclosure, in foreclosure, um, equity, no equity, short sale. These are things that can be popping up. This is a question that I ask a lot of people live, and I'm not going to be able to see the response, but I, I'm pretty much going to know a little bit about people's psyche watching this and looking at this from their home right now, whether on their tablet, computer, laptop, or on their smartphone. As a real estate agent, who are you? Are you a full-time agent or are you a part-time agent? And I ask this question because it's important. Who do you identify as? So if you're a part-time agent, that's okay. Normally, I would say, raise your hand if you're a part-time agent. Raise your hand if you're a full-time agent. Part-time agents, raise your hand again. And then I scream profanities at them. And I say, don't ever say that you're a part-time agent, because quite honestly, nobody wants to deal with anybody part-time. Nobody wants to deal with a part-time heart surgeon. So get that in your head. So if you work a nine-to-five job, you're busy as hell. You're servicing your clients, you're canvassing, you're going out, and you're talking to other people in the industry. I'll be free by 4.30. I have an opening at 12.30. 12.30 is your lunch. Wink, wink. So that's important. Who do you identify in the real estate industry? Because people ask me all the time, Matt, will you work with me? Yeah, I'll absolutely work with you. And I'll get to that a little bit later in the presentation. But who do you identify as in real estate? And the reason why I say this is there's real estate agents that claim to be hard money lenders. And then there's private lenders or and or hard money lenders that, that claim to be, you know, 
real estate agents or marketing people and attorneys and title companies and mortgage professionals, investors, the list goes on. So I tell people, stay in your lane. And I say it respectfully. If you're a real estate agent and you don't know anything about investing, that's okay. You can learn about it, but you really can't be a jack of all trades when it comes to distressed real estate. Because really what you could do is drive somebody into foreclosure and really whoever that's going to hurt, it's going to be the homeowner. It's going to be a family. It's going to have people have kids. So really be careful what you promise because all day long, I hear the, you know, I overpromised and I underdelivered from either an agent or I hear from a homeowner that they felt like they were rocked because the person said they were going to do something and they didn't do it. And that's the other thing. People don't realize they list these properties. What if the property is not allowed to be listed? Meaning maybe the investor doesn't want to do a short sale on it. You know, maybe the only options they have are to you know, bring up the rearage, bring it current, or do a deed in lieu on the property. Uh, and, and that's it. Or, or, or maybe they failed modifications. That's another thing we're going to be talking about in the presentation. So I've got over 18 years of experience doing short sales. I have a 96% success rate in getting these things approved. Then does that, does that mean that I've closed in every single one of them? No, it does not. No, it does not. I've learned a lot over the last almost 19 years. 100% I have. Can I help sellers and buyers nationwide? Absolutely. But they want, they have to want to be helped. And that brings me to the 96%. You know, have I gone through a ton of stuff? Yes. A ton of bullshit. Yes. But I want to make this clear. This is a great time for people that may or may not have been in the industry before. Maybe they're jumping back into the industry. Maybe they want to understand how the industry works. This is important. Because I've already taken out all the guesswork for you. So if you have a question, chances are I'm going to be able to answer it. So it's really important that you understand that. I will say, please, if you can, pay 100% attention to this presentation because it's going to go fast and we're going to go furious. The other thing I want to say is, when you're working with homeowners, and you're going to hear me again, and I'm going to say it in the presentation later on. When, when listing agents go to homeowners and they talk to them, they're going on listing presentations, right? They're listing the house. They want to list, right? No, it's wrong. You need to go on a listening appointment, especially with somebody that might be in distress. So think about that going forward. It's listening. It's not listing. And really, you should be doing that with everything that you do in any business. One thing I want to cover tonight, or in general, nine out of 10 real estate agents, your peers in the industry, don't want to get involved with short sales. They stay away from it. Think about that for a second. So if you're in a room with nine other real estate agents, some of them are successful, some of them just plain suck, and some of them just want to hang out during the day because they've got nothing else to do. And that's fine. That's your competition. But the other person who's at your competition is the person looking back at you in the mirror. So don't worry so much about the competition. Worry about being the best you can be. Focus more on that. But nine out of 10 real estate agents will not go um, specifically for distressed real estate. So think about what you've learned when you go to real estate school. You're basically learning the rules and guidelines. That's it. That's all they require. And you take a test. Some people find it super easy. I know people that have failed it five, six times to get their real estate license. It is what it is. Think about really long and hard who you want to be in the industry of real estate. Distressed real estate is not for everybody. But I will say, if you're going to get into real estate and you're really going to make it a career, definitely pick up a mentor. Be with somebody or, or ask somebody to mentor them. Be a part of a team. Maybe hire a coach. There's going to be a tremendous amount of trial and error when you're working with distressed real estate. Most real estate brokers and agents really want you to go after the low-hanging fruit. So if you've got a broker and or a team lead, they're going to ask you specifically, stay out of the weeds, go for the low-hanging fruit, 
off the branches because that's going to be your quickest way to a paycheck. I don't agree with that. Much like when you grow up and you go to school, like when I went to school, it was go to school, get an education, get a job, go get work with the company, retire with them, get your 401k, get your pension. Yeah, that shit don't work. Not in today's industry. You've got people that are 17 years old making a ton of money on YouTube and you've got 18, 19 year olds on OnlyFans making, you know, $100,000 a month. You really going to go and want to go work for a regular company? No, you want to be your boss. So since 2005, I've never wanted to be a real estate agent. And why? I never wanted to be a real estate agent because I knew that I always was destined for some type of greatness. Not that being a real estate agent isn't great. It's just that I wanted to help as many people as I could. For me, I was always considered the underdog. So I wanted to make it clear that, you know, this is something that I own and I'm really great at it. You know, I'm not going to say, you know, I'm, you know, I'm the, the best in the industry, but I'm very compassionate, understanding, and you really have to understand the rules, regulations, and guidelines to be successful in this industry. Can't slap, you can't just slap shit up against the wall and hope it sticks. You're dealing with people's lives. Remember that. So that's why I took my company from 2005, 2015. We went nationwide to now. A ton of people left the industry. They felt short sales dried up, which they didn't. They were always there. And let me just tell you, short sales never going away. Which brings me to my next slide. And this is really super important. I don't, pe I don't think people realize what had happened during COVID and the fact that the industry itself has now changed forever when it comes to short sales. And let this be the first time you're hearing it, not, I don't know if you want to whip out your phones right now and record this, put it on social media, save it for yourself, maybe even save it for your broker. Tell your broker, hey, we should get Matt Marinoff in here and talk because it sounds like he really knows what's going on with the industry. With Hey, good question. Is that something that you do? Do you go to broker's offices to talk about short sales? I believe it or not, in this September, I just started it. Uh, we're going into October right now, and I'm already booking into early November, uh, talking specifically with real estate agents in their offices, yes. That's great. Okay. Thanks for bringing that up. It's a great segue there. Um, so how do you determine whether it's a short sell or not? Well, there's a couple of key factors here, right? People say right now the industry is red hot fire people buy properties they're overpaying well that's great but what if that person defaulted on their loan what if they had three modifications and they defaulted what if or two more let's say they had two modifications now they went through covid and during those two years where basically the world shut down what it seemed like now you've got an extra two years of mortgage payments so people are saying to me matt you don't know what you're talking about actually i do know what i'm talking about because these people either tapped into their equity lines when the interest rates were super low. Think about this for a second. The interest rates were so low that people refied their houses and ATM the shit out of those properties. And they were pulling the equity out, right? Now they've got higher mortgage, maybe a lower interest rate, but now they have maybe no equity in their house or little to no equity in their house. What do you think is going to happen over the next couple of years if those people lose their house? Sorry, if they lose their job or if they have to relocate or if there's a divorce or if there's a death in the family or maybe, you know, one of the, the breadwinners in the house, mostly women these days. They lose their job. Now what? Now the husband's, you know, he's shit out of a lock because he's already sucked the equity out of the house. The reality is people don't realize, but if you go late on your mortgage, it's it, it's going to have such a massive impact. So that's why I say, you know, these people that are pulling out equity lines in the property or pulled up equity lines in the property, or maybe sometime along the way over the last couple of years, maybe they had medical bills. Maybe they didn't pay attention to them. Maybe they got judgments against them. Maybe there's judgments against the property. I would say probably 23 have been brought into at least four scenarios where people thought there was equity in their property and there wasn't because they did a modification 
and they didn't know what they signed. So there's a lot of factors that come into what's going on in 2023. So the other thing that, that is upsetting to me is that the government was telling people, hey, do a forbearance, reach out to your mortgage company, explain to them you can't pay their mortgage. You know what happened? People were taking advantage of it. People just stopped paying their mortgage and say, hey, I can't pay it. But think about this. Did you really think you were going to go into a forbearance and the mortgage industry wasn't going to come back around and say, okay, well, you know, you owe us $80,000 of back payments now. The forbearance was only really supposed to be for three months. But now we went over, you know, 18 months. And now we're going across almost into two years. We have to do a loan modification. Okay, no problem. Now they're looking at your hardship and they're looking at your tax returns for the last two years. Uh-oh. Did you commit to what? Make sense? Mm-hmm. This is scary. So I tell people in 2023, get ready. Mark this on your calendar. Because this is where things are going to get crazy. How many modifications did they do? How many forbearances did they do? Did they do a deferment? Do you know that if you started your mortgage and let's say you paid into it for nine years and you had a 30-year mortgage and now all of a sudden you're doing a deferment because you couldn't pay two, three years, whatever it is, and your lender allowed it, now you're tacking on three years 